That's a huge bombshell. Holy. Okay, I see why they brought him back. Welcome back to Northern Perspective, everyone. I'm Cypher. And I'm Fox. Justin Trudeau's testimony at the public inquiry was supposed to be the last one of the week. However, just one day after Justin Trudeau threw CSIS under the bus, there was a sudden change of schedule, and another witness was scheduled to testify. That witness was David Vignon, the director of CSIS. Let's take a look. Um, so the first thing I'm going to ask you about this morning, Director, is a meeting that took place on October 27th, 2022, at which you briefed the Prime Minister and PMO on foreign interference. Before I pull up any documents relating to that, um, I just want to ask you what your recollection of that meeting is. Uh, thank you. Uh, the meeting was um, at the request of the clerk of the Privy Council office. Um, I had briefed uh, the clerk and the National Security Intelligence Advisor at my request at CSIS headquarters earlier in September to give them a, uh, an overview of, uh, of significant cases of uh, related foreign interference. And uh, as a result, um, I was asked to go brief the Prime Minister. So that, that was the genesis of the, uh, of the uh, October meeting. Okay. Um, Ms. Ms. Herrera. Can I ask you to pull up CAN 015842? Thank you. So, Director, this is a set of briefing notes dated October 26, 22, which I understand are notes that were prepared for you in advance of this meeting. Before I start asking you about the specifics of these notes, I'm going to ask you to explain to the Commission, help us understand what briefing notes are. Yes. Um... So typically, uh, for uh, for a briefing, an important briefing to a minister, the prime minister, senior officials, um, we have uh, sometimes a little bit of heads up uh, or uh, a longer period of time to prepare. In this case, um, uh, my professional staff uh, had uh, longer uh, heads up, so they were able to prepare a lot of material. Uh, for uh, my reference uh, to be able to prepare for uh, the, the meeting in question. So the material is a combination of, uh, of our policy and operational experts, intelligence experts, um, looking at the issues that uh, I would be potentially uh, having to brief. But uh, as I, I would, the expression I would use, it's also try to cover the waterfront. What are some other issues that could come up that you know, I would uh, need to be uh, to have some uh, reference material? So the, the professional staff puts this together, goes up to uh, um, a couple of, uh, of review by senior uh, officials inside the CSIS. And in this case, uh, because of the type of material, the deputy director policy would be uh, approving the final material, and that would be then transmitted to me. So this material is for my, my review, uh, for reference point. Uh, it's not something I need to approve because, you know, it's, it's for my own use. It's not something I need to transmit to somebody else. And so that is, uh, uh, this is why you have in some of these briefing uh, uh, binders, as we refer to them, a uh, fairly large amount of different documents. So grosso modo, that, that would be the, the process of how we are putting together the, the briefing material. Okay, so you've said they're not approved by you. How do you use them? Do you, do you read briefing notes during your meetings or? So the way I would be using this, and uh, and again, it, it depends on the the uh, the, the type of briefings. Uh, if it's a more formal briefing, uh, organized like a cabinet meeting or something, I normally would have something more prepared. I have limited amount of time, and I have some very specific points to go to. So that would be more of a scripted approach. Um, but uh, the vast majority of the briefings and, and meetings would be material that I read ahead of time. Um, I take my own notes uh, and I uh, uh, refine 
of what I expect to be asked uh, to to uh, to be uh, to discuss, I refine the the key messages or the key elements, the key facts facts I would need to uh, convey to the person, the persons I'm briefing, and so uh, that will be how I would normally be uh, using this material. Okay, um, Mr. Herrera. Um, can you scroll down, please, Director Vigneault? I'm going to be asking you some questions about specific statements that are in this. So, Mr. Herrera, can you scroll down to page two of five, please? There we go. Director, you'll see a statement there that says, however, Canada has been slower than our Five Eyes allies to respond to the FI threat with legislative and other initiatives, such as proactively publicizing successful disruption of FI activities as a means of deterring future efforts. Can you recall whether this is something that you conveyed to the Prime Minister and the PMO in this meeting? Um, so, Madam Commissioner, uh, what I remember of, the, of this briefing, uh, some briefings uh, are more uh, uh, are more uh, specific. I, I believe an imprint in your memory uh, uh, stronger than others. This one, I remember clearly that it was a briefing to cover a number of very specific points, specific foreign interference cases. So what you see here, the, the, this document, covers what I would call more foreign interference uh, 101 or, or background information on foreign interference. So in, in the process of briefing the prime minister and his team uh, and, and, and the clerk uh, on, on, in October, my point was not to cover uh, background information on foreign interference was to dive right into those very specific cases. So um, I would not have uh, have gone through these notes and and cover something uh, uh, like Canada has been slower than our Five Eyes allies uh, or, or, or others because uh, these are statements that I had uh, made before in public and in uh, in. Uh, uh, in private or during uh, briefing to ministers, but also because the purpose of that uh, briefing uh, was to cover very specific cases of foreign interference and also one or two uh, other um, uh, issues that were not related to foreign interference. So, Trudeau, you said he never told you this. What do you have to say now? There's a briefing note, it's dated. And you have the director of CSIS off the cuff, basically saying, oh, yeah, you know, there's a bunch of uh, briefings that, you know, you may not recommend or may not remember because, you know, there wasn't anything significant that happened. But this is one that was, you know, a, a very significant point that we spoke, to, spoke about. So I remember it very clearly. Sounds like CSIS isn't as incompetent as you're trying to make them out to be. Of course they're not. It's their job to be right about this sort of thing. And there's very specific information in here. Canada has been slower than our Five Eyes allies to respond to the foreign interference, that's what FI means in here, threat with legislative and other initiatives, such as proactively publicizing successful disruption of foreign interference activities as a means of deterring future efforts. What does that mean? It's when you are actually able to disrupt them, one of the recommendations from CSIS is, is you tell everybody that you did that versus what Trudeau has been doing, which is telling literally nobody. So Trudeau was questioned by Michael Chong's lawyer. Did the director say words to the effect of or convey the message that, as you see here, Canada has been slower than our five eyes allies to respond to the foreign interference threat? Uh, no. Trudeau's response, categorically, no. Not even, I'm not sure, or uh, 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 no, I don't think so. No. Wow. This is, this, this is huge, folks. You now have a, a rift between the prime minister and his most important intelligence service. And you have the prime minister swearing under oath yeah i was gonna say is this not perjury because he was under oath under oath that he was not told this and you have david vignon under oath saying and showing that i absolutely did tell him this i, I don't know about you folks 
I'm leaning to believe David Vigneault, the director of CSIS. Oh, me too, for sure. Just saying. That's a huge bombshell. Holy. Okay. Um, I see why they brought him back. Thank you. That, that's helpful, director. Um, so I take it this wasn't something you mentioned in this specific meeting, but it was something that you'd, you had mentioned before or after. Yes, I had, okay. uh, as I mentioned, uh, both in private and in, uh, in public. Okay. Mr. Herrera, if you can keep, keep scrolling down to page three of five, please. Okay, there we go. There, thank you. The next statement, Director, is ultimately state actors are able to conduct foreign interference successfully in Canada because there are no consequences, either legal or political. Foreign interference is therefore a low risk and high reward endeavor. So I'll ask you the same questions with respect to this statement, Director. Is this something that you conveyed to the Prime Minister and the PMO in this meeting specifically or otherwise? So uh, I would not have uh, used uh, that uh, that specific uh, expression at that meeting because we were talking very specific uh, cases and these cases were uh, complex, uh, new ones, and, and the, the focus was entirely on, on those cases. Uh, however, um, this is a line that I have used before. Uh, I have uh, said the, that exact line uh, quite a few times. Um, that's one of the reasons why uh, my professional staff, when they're putting these these uh, briefing material together, they're not only bringing me new facts, new analysis and information, but they also refer to how I have verbalized some of these uh, these issues in the past so that when I go through the material to prepare myself for, for, for different meetings, this is something that, uh, that I remember that reflects on me. So that specific line, I have used it before uh, uh, quite a few times uh, and to the point now that uh, some other people are starting to use it, uh, use that exact same uh, uh, approach to describe foreign interference uh, and uh, uh, I think even to the, uh, the commission this was used and uh, in the last number of days I have a number of uh, colleagues who have uh, reminded me that they have heard me say that uh, exact line uh, quite a few times. Okay. Thank you. Um, Mr. Herrera, can you please scroll down to page five of five? There we go. Um, so, Director, again, the same questions with respect to these statements, ultimately better protecting Canadian dem democratic institutions against foreign interference will require a shift in the government's perspective and a willingness to take decisive action and impose consequences on perpetrators until foreign interference is viewed as constituting an ex existential threat to Canadian democracy and the government forcefully and actively responds, these threats will persist. Is this something that you conveyed to the Prime Minister and the PMO in the October 27th meeting, or is it something that you've conveyed at other times? So, uh, Madam Commissioner, my, uh, my recollection is, is the same as previous statements. These are more um, uh, tombstone facts about foreign interference, as opposed as the purpose of the meeting in October, which was about these cases. Um, this is something that uh, uh, I have uh, absolutely said a number of times, again, in, in public and in, uh, in private. Um, I have used uh, expressions uh, like, uh, we need to impose cost, uh, we need to uh, harden uh, Canada. Um, because when you consider foreign interference, um, you know, the intent of, of, a, of a foreign country to use foreign interference uh, to pursue their interest uh, will, will is something for them that is existential, that they, they are gonna pursue no matter what. So one of the very specific and important thing to do is to, uh, as I said, harden the target, increase our resilience, both in government and in public uh, about foreign interference. Uh, and that is one way of reducing the impact of foreign interference and impose cost on the perpetrator of that. And this is why, Madam Commissioner, um, I, for example, I've been talking about having sunshine policy related to foreign interference 
because the solution to foreign interference is not just from the government. It comes from a society that is informed, it comes from a society that uh, uh, is able to, uh, in some specific ways, uh, in uh, the democratic processes, but also in a normal day-to-day uh, -day lives, being able to identify that there's something bizarre here and that you know uh, people can, can uh, understand that they can do something about this, they can report this information. And that is the only way that we will be able to, to reduce the impact on, of foreign interference and, uh, and eventually uh, make Canadians uh, safer. So this is very, very telling because you have the Inquisitor asking him about you know specific things in this briefing note. And he's saying, well, I didn't specifically talk about these things in that meeting because the meeting, what he's saying, is was uh, circled around very specific cases. Okay, but what he is saying is that in other meetings and in public, I have said these exact things. So for Trudeau to say that, well, you know, I wasn't told or it wasn't exactly communicated or it was more suggested or any of this other BS that he's saying, this completely refutes it. And, you know, we've, we've heard from the conservatives in, in question period when they refer to this. And it's great to hear this directly from the director of CSIS himself in that sunshine is the best disinfectant when it comes to foreign interference. What does he mean by that? What it means is you don't hide everything behind cabinet confidence and, well, you know, national security. What he's saying is tell everybody. Well, and that was, I think, the, the most important point that he just made was that Canadians need to be educated about how our democratic process works, how our parliament works, and and so that we as citizens can recognize when something's wrong and then we can go to the appropriate authorities. All of us together are, are a huge piece in this puzzle that foreign interference will not work or will not work as well if Canadians are informed and can spot things when something's wrong. Well, and what he's essentially saying, and it's very astute, is that the first line of defense when it comes to foreign interference is not CSIS, it's not the police, it's not the government, it's the Canadian public. That's right, it's us. Because, to Fox's point, if you see something weird going on, you need to be educated enough as it relates to you know, the, the proper process of whatever you're, you're observing to be able to say, that doesn't look right, I need to report that. And then when it's identified, one of the examples that Vignon was, uh, was showing in this brief was that when Australia identified something related to Indian foreign interference, they told the general public about it. They didn't hide it. They didn't say, well, you know, we can't tell the general public because that could, you know, put pe people's lives at risk. They said, no, tell everybody. And and he even made reference to this earlier. He's like, if you, if you do that, then you incur greater cost to the effort, meaning you're making it more and more expensive, more and more difficult for these foreign actors to actually complete what they want to do. The fact that the liberal government has been keeping this all under wraps for years that's one of the reasons why CSIS is probably saying, yeah, it's very low cost effort. They've used that term. Well, and it makes you wonder why the government is trying to hide China's foreign interference. I suppose one thing you could say is that you don't want the general public to start having, uh, what would you say, to start losing faith in, in our electoral process, in our systems, in our government. That would be bad because I've said it before that apathy is the death of democracy. So you definitely don't want that. But at the same time, you need your public to be aware of what's going on, what they need to be looking out for, and who they need to be looking out for. Well, and you can increase the confidence in the electoral process by laying out exactly how it's supposed to work. And then when you see something wrong, you immediately report it. That's what you do. So this is very, very interesting that this is the angle that this is going. And it makes complete sense. So good on David Vigneault for coming back and, and, and basically putting his job on the line and in terms of standing up to the lies that Trudeau told the other day. 
Um, Director, you've mentioned a few times that this meeting was about specific cases. And just to be clear, these cases are not something you were able to speak about in this forum. Is that correct? Uh, uh, that's correct. Uh, I can maybe just precise that they were not cases related to uh, to uh, elections. They were uh, more uh, uh, cases related to overall foreign interference and uh, one or two other topics that were, uh, were not related to foreign interference. Okay, but uh, they obviously they uh, are uh, highly classified. Um, Mr. Herrera, you can take that document down now, please, and pull 4079. So, Director Vigneault, uh, we'll wait for it to come up, but this is another document that's dated October 26, 2022. There it is. Um, so, without getting into any of its classified content, can you tell the Commission what this document is? Like, were these also briefing notes prepared for you, or...? Yes, uh, Madam Commissioner, this is um, one of the uh, supporting material that will have been included in my um, my uh, briefing binder. Um, it speaks to a, a one of those specific cases that I, uh, I said that I briefed the Prime Minister on that day. So just looking at it, this is um, the People's Republic of China redacted, clandestinely supported candidate redacted, and then redacted mobilizing support for preferred candidates at all level of government. PRC officials in Canada often conduct election for, uh, related foreign interference through local networks. Redacted channeling donations and other assistance to preferred candidates will foster a bond of obligation to the People's Republic of China that will pay dividends for the promotion of Chinese Communist Party interest if elected. So this is what I was saying in previous videos, is that once the PRC individual gets elected and they're sitting in Ottawa in the House of Commons, they're not going to be voting in Can Canada's best interest or in the best interest of their constituents. They're going to be voting in the best interest of the PRC. So it's a, about a, a specific issue. Um, and uh, of course, you, you can see some of the information. It, it speaks to foreign interference by the People's Republic of China. Uh, so some of the information has been uh, has been released. Uh, and so this is uh, one of the cases uh, that uh, I briefed the Prime Minister on that day. Mr. Herrera, can you scroll down a little bit so we see the text box? Perfect. Thank you. So, Director Vignier, you'll see that text box, which is a summary of the, the redacted under information underneath it. And it says, PRC officials could be emboldened in their electoral interference efforts by the 2021 defeat of former Richmond MP Kenny Chu. Are you able to recall whether that is something that you conveyed to the Prime Minister in the October 27th meeting? Um Madam Commissioner, I don't remember if I've, if I've used these exact words, but talking about that specific case, um, I put that case in uh, in context uh, in relation to other PRC activities. So uh, I cannot recall if that exact line was used, but it is uh, that would have been part of the, the context that uh, would have situated the case, I believe, the Prime Minister on in relations to overall uh, PRC uh, uh, interference activities. So this is really significant. Remember, Trudeau has said on many, many, many occasions, the election integrity of the 2021 election held. He said that multiple times. And about 2019, if I'm not mistaken. And what this summary is, is saying... PRC officials could be emboldened in their electoral interference efforts by the 2021 defeat of former Richmond uh, MP Kenny Chu. Now, if you recall, Kenny Chu was a conservative candidate that lost in the election. So, Fox, just from a common sense approach, what do you take by this briefing summary. What does that mean to you? So it sounds like the PRC did something or assisted someone in a way that made Kenny Chu lose and thereby their goal was successful, Kenny Chu losing. And now they're like, oh, okay, that's good. That worked. 
let's do it again or let's do more something to that effect that's that's exactly what it means to me the fact that the prc was successful and evidently CSIS was monitoring or reported some electoral interference efforts and actions as a re in the 2021 election circled around Kenny Chu. Obviously, it looks like that was successful. So in their success of preventing Kenny Chu from being able to win his seat, that's an affirmation to the PRC that what you're doing is working. And it's a signpost of this is something we can actually do in Canada. We can have influence. Now, going back to what Trudeau said, the election integrity held. Really? Well, you have a briefing note from, P from CISA saying, evidently, at least for one, one conservative candidate, it did not hold. That's something to think about. Thank you, Director. We're now going to leave October 27th, 2022 and go to February 23rd, 2023. Uh, Mitch Herrera, can you please pull CAN 4495? Thank you. So, Director, the next meeting here is, uh, we understand this was a meeting on February. The notes are dated February 21st, 2023, but we understand the meeting took place on February 23rd, 2023, and that this was a meeting with the Prime Minister's office, staff from the PMO, but not the Prime Minister himself, to brief them on the media leaks of classified information. So, were these also briefing notes that were prepared for you in advance of this meeting? Yes, the uh, it's the same process that I described uh, that the uh, uh, briefing material, uh, there was a request for uh, a briefing to the, the Prime Minister's office. So again, my staff would have been working to uh, pull together uh, information, again, covering the waterfront. Um, Sometimes you, you you have an idea of what uh, what you believe the topic might be, but you walk into uh, into it, and there there might be quite a few other things. So again, this is an example of uh, of uh, the team putting together uh, material that covers uh, quite a few aspects of uh, uh, of uh, foreign interference in this case. Okay, um, Mr. Herrera, can you scroll down, please, to page three of six? The second bullet is what I'm interested in seeing. So again, Director, I'm going to take you to a few specific statements. Um, first one is, we have also observed online media activities aimed at discouraging Canadians, particularly of Chinese heritage, from supporting the Conservative Party leader Aaron O'Toole and particularly Stevenson Richmond East candidate Kenny Chu. Then we have a redaction and then the timing of these efforts to align with Conservative polling improvements, the similarities in language with the articles published by PRC state media, and the partnership agreements between these Canada-based outlets and PRC entities all suggest that these efforts were orchestrated or directed by the PRC. So first of all, was this something that you conveyed to the PMO at the February 23 meeting? So Madam Commissioner, uh, I should have maybe uh, in my, uh, when I described the general meeting, I, I should have uh, added, I think a piece that is really relevant. Um, in preparing for the uh, for today's uh, airing, uh, working with the material uh, that uh, was uh, was prepared ahead of time and disclosed, um, my recollection is that that meeting was very specifically focused on uh, uh, to, to discuss an article in the Globe and Mail that I believe had been published on the 17th or the 18th, so a few days before that uh, was talking about uh, some uh, unauthorized disclosures of documents. And um, if uh, I remember, there was a, a reference at the end of that article about the uh, 11 candidates. Uh, so the issue that has been canvassed in the, at the inquiry before. So the uh, this specific briefing that so the material you you uh, you uh, you have a reference uh, Ms. Chowdhury, and that specific briefing to the prime minister's office was focused to discuss on that part um so um i think that, that in terms of context that is important 
coming back to you now, your specific questions about these two paragraphs, Ms. Chowdhury, uh, again, I would not have been uh, using that specific briefing material because the focus of that uh, of the briefing to the PMO was on the uh, the Globe and Mail article, and so. What you have here, those uh, bullets, uh, represent, the uh, again, what I describe as general briefing material prepared for me, again, to cover different angles as required, but the specific briefing, uh, specific uh, discussion was uh, focused on the, uh, uh, on the specific information contained in the uh, Global Mail article. Isn't it interesting that Justin Trudeau is far more concerned about CSIS leaks about foreign interference to the media than foreign interference itself. Yeah, that's a good point. Because that that this is what she's talking about here, folks. This this briefing was in February of 2023. This is when the whole foreign interference scandal blew up. It was a result of that first Globe and Mail article. Everything exploded as a result of that. Yeah, and I remember Trudeau uh, and his minister saying, you know, we're going to find the person responsible and we're going to take them down. Like we're going to we're going to prosecute them for to the fullest extent of the law, that sort of thing. So that whole briefing was circled around. All right, who did it? Who 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 leaked this stuff? Not. Hmm. We should be concerned about foreign interference in Canada. Well, because it was to their benefit. Let's be real here. Any foreign interference that has happened in the last eight years appears to have been to the liberals benefit and uh wasn't in their benefit when some of the CSIS operatives have said enough is enough you're not listening here you go public this is what's actually going on and prime minister is not doing his job and we received confirmation of that last week well and to me it doesn't seem like Vignon is too concerned about finding the whistleblower and i don't think he should be either no because that's not his top priority here because i think he sees the motivation behind the whistleblowers because look at Trudeau last week he's sitting there denying that Vignon had even been you know telling him a lot of this stuff and so that is actually proof of the whistleblowers um statement in their in their op-ed that they published in the Globe and Mail last year which is nobody in elected positions is listening to what we're screaming at them well, and I have no proof of this. This is just wild speculation. It's possible Vignon is the whistleblower. It's very possible. And it's possible that if he's not, he knows exactly who the whistleblower is. But remember, there was multiple whistleblowers. Well, then he knows who they are. But it he doesn't seem so conf- concerned about finding them. Like, to me, it seems like... I don't want to say that he's grateful. I mean, I can't get inside his head, but... I think he's looking at the context of what they did and why they did it. And that the the outcome is benefiting Canada and Canadians more than keeping it secret. Right. That the motivation that these patriots inside of CSIS uh, did this is for the greater good of Canada. So why are you going to go and start a witch hunt and arrest somebody like that? Why would Trudeau do that? That's a great question. Well, you, you know why Trudeau would do that. But as, a, as the head of CSIS, those are, those are agents you want to hold on to. Right, because you know they are loyal to this country at any cost. Okay, so does that mean, Director, that you, this was not something that you conveyed during that meeting because the focus of the meeting was the 11 candidates? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, I'm still going to ask you a question about it, which was, we know that in the aftermath of the 2021 election, the site assessment was the the extent to which the PRC was behind these uh, online and media activities couldn't be conclusively determined. So my question is, does the statement in these briefing notes indicate a shift in this assessment, where it says all suggest that these efforts were orchestrated or, or directed by the PRC? Is that something new? Is that something that came from additional evidence? Is it a shift in this? in the services assessment? Um, uh, Madam Commissioner, I would say that it is not. Uh, This is uh, one different formulation of the same ideas that have been uh, been, uh, canvassed and assessed by site. 
which is uh, there was a, uh, a number of, of, uh, of messages. There were some messages uh, that also were uh, conveyed by uh, um, media entities associated with the uh, Chinese Communist Party. Uh, and so uh, the fact that we could see a, a level of convergence between these different messages uh, suggested that yes, uh, they uh, that they would have been uh, potentially orchestrated by the PRC, and so uh, reviewing the the classified site uh, site report, uh, there was this wording was not meant to convey any other uh, this uh, new analysis or or a higher level of certainty about the activity. It is a, a different way of conveying that. We've seen a convergence. We've seen there were some some PRC entities involved in it, but we were not able to conclude. Site was not able to conclude that it was uh, that was specifically orchestrated uh, by the PRC. Uh, so that, that's why, uh, from, from uh, my perspective, uh, there was absolutely not a uh, change of analysis. It was just a different uh, wording. Um, Mr. Herrera, can you now scroll down, please, to page five of six? Thank you. So the language I'm looking for is uh, maybe scroll up a little bit from there. Scroll up again. There we go. So you'll see in this bullet, um, Director, in February 2021, I briefed the Prime Minister on PRC-linked individuals interfering with the 2019 Liberal nomination in Don Valley North. Do you have any recollection of this meeting taking place in February 2021? Um, unfortunately, Madam Commissioner, I, I don't remember that, that briefing specifically. Uh, and in the period of time uh, um, between uh, reviewing the material and appearing in front of you, uh, my staff were able to show me some, some documents in relation. So again, briefing material in relation to, the, uh, to the, that uh, briefing that had been prepared for me. But I do not have a specific recollection of that, uh, that meeting in, in 2021. Okay, so we, it happened, but you don't have a recollection of it. Um, well, I, what, sorry, uh, Ms. Shabby, what I can say is that, uh, yeah, I do believe it happened. You know, uh, we checked, you know, uh, calendars and uh, there was briefing material. But as I say, uh, I cannot just take the briefing material that was prepared and, and, uh, and assess that this is what was discussed at that meeting. As I described, the briefing material covers many other issues uh, often than, than what is the uh, exact, uh, how the how exactly the meeting unfolded. So I just do not have a, a specific recollection of that uh, 2021 briefing. So I've, I've heard him say this a few times and I'm extremely concerned about how these briefings actually unfolded. Because what he's saying is that his staff prepared him a briefing to take into the, uh, you know, into the room with the prime minister. So he's prepared to talk about all this stuff, important stuff. And what he's saying is when he walks in, the prime minister says, I want to talk about this. And that's what we're talking about. So what the director of CSIS is essentially saying is, he doesn't necessarily get to brief the prime minister on the stuff that he feels is important because Trudeau won't let him because he wants to talk about something else. Example, there was all of that stuff related to um, uh, the foreign interference around Aaron O'Toole and Kenny Chu and, and the rest of that stuff that was happening. That was in his briefing note for that one meeting in, in February of 2023. Trudeau wasn't interested in talking about that. Trudeau wanted to, to talk about the Globe and Mail article and how CSIS operatives leaked that information. So, in some cases, Trudeau may have been right in that, oh, well, you know, that wasn't disclosed to me because you wouldn't allow it. Like, this is crazy, folks. If I'm the prime minister and CSIS comes in and says, I have a briefing for you, I'm going to say, all right, I'm going to shut up. What do you have to say? I would want an executive summary of what's in the briefing. And then based on that, I would say, okay, so based on that, 
what do you think is uh, our, our, our biggest pain point here, director? And then you'd say, well, my opinion is this, this, and this. And I may disagree, I may not. But then I would know the, the specific pieces to focus on. And then the pieces we don't get to, I pass down to the Minister of Public Safety. Off you go. Spend, spend a bunch of time on this. Like, this is not rocket science, folks. This sounds like Vigno has been given specific, I would say, protocol by, by Justin Trudeau on how these briefings are supposed to work. Almost everything is verbal only. I'm not reading anything. And we're going to discuss only what I want to. It's outrageous. Like, or that that's my take on this, Fox. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, it sounds like Trudeau's just like this spoiled little rich kid that doesn't want to do the work and wants to talk about what he wants to talk about, what he thinks is important. I mean, as the Prime Minister, it's not your job really to decide what's important. That's what all your ministers are for. That's what your head of CSIS is for. These people come to you and say, hey, this is a problem within my file. I need you to be aware of it. We need to figure out how to address it. You don't get to choose. Like, they're the guys with the boots on the ground. They are the ones that will tell you what the problems are. But Trudeau is so vain to him, like the biggest problem was that this information got leaked out to the public. And I think this whole inquiry is a problem to him because if you recall how he was like at the very, very beginning, he was trying to sweep it under the rug by calling us all racist. And then when that didn't work, he hired his ski buddy to be a quote unquote special rapporteur to determine whether or not there was going to be a public inquiry. And David Johnston was leaning towards no. And now we have our public inquiry and we're finding all this extra stuff that we would not know about if there was no public inquiry. Stuff like this. Right. And it shows that, frankly, the Prime Minister does not give a damn about foreign interference. Only when it's against him or his caucus. Okay, that's fair. Um... Can you tell us, though, whether that would have, in your recollection, whether that would have been the first time that you briefed the Prime Minister on uh, Don Valley North? So if you go back to uh, the uh, the initial briefings uh, on um, uh, about Don Valley North around 2019, uh, the passage of time between 2019 and 2021, uh, my assumption is that this was not the first time that I was uh, would have personally uh, talk to the prime minister about this but again i, I it's not because the um the, the the specific information there uh is is highlighting the specifics that i it's exactly how it unfolded so i do not want to create an impression for the commission here that uh, i have uh, i have that recollection uh, i just do not uh but what i i know for a fact is that uh, we had uh, the material had been discussed uh, uh, at some length, as I think has been canvassed to the uh, to the inquiry uh, about the information 2019 and moving on. Okay, so I, uh, Director, if I'm understanding correctly, um, would it be fair to say that just because information is in briefing materials for you, the commission can't take for granted that that information was necessarily conveyed that day or during that briefing? Absolutely. Uh, I think, you know, what is uh, the, the reality of, of, uh, of, uh, of these types of briefings is uh, uh, it, they're not, uh, I'll use again the example of a, of a cabinet uh, briefing. Uh, we'll not go into the details, of course, but uh, if you go to a cab briefing, you have, uh, there will be five or six items being uh, discussed in, a, in one session. You will have uh, a limited amount of time for each of these elements, and you have a very um, a prescribed approach to follow. So most people, when they will go to these scripted meetings, if I can use that expression, will have indeed such a script and you will follow so that you're able to reconstruct much more easily what was said. If you compare and contrast with with these types of, of meetings that that are, uh, are that we're discussing this morning, um, these are much more fluid. Um, you know, uh, my my staff uh, would have prepared me for uh, whatever uh, information related to foreign interference, uh, but the specific discussion is uh, is often uh, quite different. 
and, and the last thing maybe I can say is that it would not have been, uh, it's not uh, extraordinary to go to a, a briefing having material and having prepared yourself to discuss a topic and it's something uh, completely different that happens to be uh, to be uh, discussed so um, that's when I, I joke with my staff uh, that uh, I bring my uh, uh, I bring my briefing material and I bring my uh, hockey skates because you have to be able to uh, to be a very agile on the on the, uh, dealing with any issues that the person you're briefing wants to raise with you so that was a dig at Trudeau by the way and that confirms what your hypothesis was. Yeah. So obviously there's frustration and it's even been made into a bit of a joke at CSIS that, you know, they go to all of this work, they prepare this briefing and then he's like, yeah, I don't, I don't even know if I'm even going to get to discuss it. Because the thing is, I mean, the prime minister, his time is limited. So these guys probably only get an hour, maybe half an hour even, um, what once a week, once a month. They don't have a lot of time with him. So that's why they have these briefing notes because it's a summary of everything that's been going on since the last meeting. And then they can bring them to the prime minister and say, okay, it's this, 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 and this, here you go. Yeah, and, and you just lay down the hyper important points and then the prime minister can say, okay, you know, uh, that sounds important. Let's, you know, uh, um, talk to the uh, minister of public safety and work on, on, on whatever points accordingly. But like, I can understand what, you know, once in a while where the meeting, you know, takes a turn because something came up, but this sounds like it's almost every time. Yeah, it sounds like it's a frequent occurrence if they have a running joke about needing hockey skates. And I don't know about you folks, but the thing that bothers me at work the most is that if I go through a whole bunch of effort because I'm expecting, I'm being expected to do something, and then I complete that work, I present that work or submit it, and the, the response to that is, oh, I, I don't need to know that. I don't need to see that. I, I don't want to see that. So it's, it's completely, completely irrelevant to the person that I'm giving it to, even though I was asked to do it. And it's, it shows such disrespect for the people that are actually doing this work. You know, Trudeau said, oh, well, you know, these fine people, you know, and you know, we, we want to make sure that they're uh, able to do their job. Like, you don't give a crap. You disrespect them by not even talking about the stuff that they're putting in these briefings. It's just, it's, it's disgusting, frankly. Madam Commissioner, those are my questions for the witness. Thank you, Mr. Chaudhry. So uh, we'll start the cross-examination. The first one will be conducted by counsel for Michael Chang. Thank you, Commissioner. I'll ask the court operator to turn up 15842 again. Director, thank you for the evidence you've given so far. It's been extremely helpful for us all to understand your process. Um, let me ask you in a general way uh, whether you are able to confirm that this document as a whole reflects the service's views on the matters that it addresses. Uh, Madam Commissioner, I, I, I had the, the chance to review the, the material and I do believe that uh, uh, it does indeed reflect the views of the service. Um, my personal views uh, as a director of the service, uh, there are one or two nuances I would make on, on these different points. Um, there is also the fact that you know our knowledge and understanding continues to evolve. So something that was drafted in 2022 uh, would evolve in 2024. But uh, overall, I think it is a, a very useful tool for someone to see very specific information with examples of what uh, foreign interference is in, in Canada and in our democratic institutions. Thank you, sir. That's very helpful. Uh, the next question I have for you is about the passage that uh, Ms. Chaudhry showed you about the being slower than our five eyes <laughs> allies. I think it was at page two. My question is simply, and, and you may have already said this, but I want to make sure I've got it. Um, have you ever communicated this particular assessment about us being slower than our Five Eyes allies to either the Prime Minister or the Prime Minister's office? 
I knew he was going to ask that again. This guy's awesome. I love this guy. He's a great lawyer. He is. He is. And and he's like calm and cool and he, he's yeah, he's awesome. Um and just I want to throw this out there in case anybody's wondering why he's not in person today. It's because again the uh, public inquiry um the testimony was supposed to be over yesterday after Justin Trudeau testified, but it it is continuing um, because these new documents were made available. Um, so that's why most of these people are going to be remote. Yeah, so the documents were, were available at the time of Justin Trudeau. They were not available when David Vigneault first testified. And given Trudeau's answers um, on, on these documents, no doubt that played a part into why David Vigneault was brought back. So, back to the question, Mr. Vigneault. Had you ever told the Prime Minister... Or any other minister that In this the was the case. Yeah. Uh, Madam Commissioner, I, I can uh, say with, with confidence that uh, this is something that has been conveyed to uh, to the government, to ministers, the prime minister, uh, using uh, these words and, and other types of words. Um, we often, uh, in order to make sure we understand uh, 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 have the best possible assessment of a situation, we often look to uh, other jurisdictions to see what is their own analysis of the threat, uh, what, what tools they have put in place. And so the, the comparative analysis of uh, uh, with the Five Eyes, but also with, uh, with other um, uh, like-minded nations, nations who have similar uh, uh, political systems uh, as ours, or, um, or Western democracies, uh, you know, we the, do the doing the comparative analysis is a, a very useful tool, both from an intelligence point of view, but also from a policy point of view. So, I can uh, I can say with high degree of confidence that you know uh, these examples uh, I've I've used them in both private uh, briefings, but also in our uh, in my uh, speeches, public speeches, in CSIS annual reports. Uh, in uh, parliamentary testimony, uh, just this past week, uh, I was in uh, in um, testifying in front of the Canada China Committee uh, in, in the House of Commons, and I used uh, same um, same kind of analysis on on different topics linked to foreign interference. So uh, yes, uh, to question to the uh, council, uh, this has been conveyed. <laughs> okay. So, remember, remember what Trudeau said? Uh, no. And what Vigneault is saying is, well, I've communicated this in the CSIS annual report. I've communicated this in committee in parliament. I've communicated this in public speeches. I've communicated this in private briefings. How many different ways do you want him to communicate it, Trudeau, before the answer turns from no to yes? Like, come on. Right here, folks. This is going to be a big problem for Trudeau. Remember, oh. remember the the video about Katie Telford that we posted the other day. This is this will be the new one. Well, and Trudeau's testimony came off not as credible as Vignon. Like Vignon is extremely credible. He's doing his testimony very well, and Trudeau was just kind of like, no, no, you know, I I wasn't read that. I was expecting you know people to read everything for me and you know mush my food together and feed me like an airplane. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And I take it your answer would be the same for the passage at page three about there being no consequences, legal or political, for state actors who conduct foreign interference. Have I got that right? Yes, Madam uh, Commissioner. Uh, I, I elaborated on that point uh, with previous, previous questions, uh, answers, sorry. But yes, it is uh, accurate to say that, you know, I am, uh, I have said, uh, use these expressions that, and indeed, this one very specifically, low risk, high reward endeavor. Thank you. Um, now, this document, uh, as we were hearing, uh, was something that was prepared in advance of an oral briefing that you were going, you're going to give the Prime Minister on the 27th of October. Uh, and uh, we heard evidence from the Prime Minister on Wednesday that his preferred working method in intelligence matters is to rely on oral briefings rather than briefing notes. Um, is that a, a method of working that you are aware of? before you heard his evidence about that on Wednesday? Is that something that you have been alive to and have uh, sort of adjusted your um, practices uh, to, to meet? 
Madam Commissioner, I can say that in my experience, uh, I have uh, used both methods, uh, uh, specific uh, material that has been uh, written and provided to the Prime Minister, intelligence assessment or, or information, but also uh, verbal briefings. So in my experience, uh, both methods uh, have been used, depending on the situation, depending on the context, depending on, uh, on, on timing. But uh, uh, we have uh, used, I have used uh, both uh, methods of briefing. All right. And in the event that, uh, 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 let me back up and ask you this. Uh, we heard the Prime Minister say that these uh, notes were not provided to him. And I don't think you dispute that because they were meant to be your notes, not notes for him. Am I right? Yes, Madam Commissioner. I. Uh, I did not have a chance to see all the proceedings of the of the commission. I'm sorry, Madam Commissioner, but I have seen uh, I, I, I saw that specific reference from the Prime Minister, and in my recollection of the briefing is exactly the same. Thank you. Um, all right. And uh, is it your understanding then that in order to ensure that the Prime Minister or his office has been briefed on uh, a matter to do with intelligence? you should ensure that there is an oral briefing that has taken place? Excuse me, uh, Commissioner. My understanding was we're talking about these three documents, and it appears to me at least that we're venturing away from that now, and that uh, that question is outside the scope of this uh, cross-examination. Because, you know, we can't, have, we can't have Michael Chong's impeaching the testimony of the Prime Minister here, can we? Can't have that. Nope. Let's see what Michael Chung sa uh, Michael Chung's lawyer says. Commissioner, I'm content to um, uh, hear your just ruling know on you're that. On, um, you're just uh, on mute, uh, oh. uh, Commissioner. Sorry, it's Sorry, uh, Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'll just ask uh, Maid Vanner to explain the relationship between uh, his question and, and, and the three documents? Well, the, my concern is simply that uh, given that um, this document was not delivered to the Prime Minister and that the Prime Minister's uh, preferred method of receiving intelligence briefings is orally, uh, I wanted to ensure that the material in this uh, was conferred to him. Uh, one way or another. It sounds like it wasn't in the October meetings, but of course the director has had other briefings with the Prime Minister in the past. And so just given the working methods that the Prime Minister prefers, I'm wondering whether the CSIS uh, ensures that everything that is sent over in writing is also briefed orally. I will permit the question. Good, good yes, job, Hogue. Yes, this guy is smooth as silk. Good job, Hogue. Amazing. Again, a reasonable justification. Great. And you know what? I know that there were some concerns at the very, very beginning when Justice Hogue was announced as overseeing this commission that, oh, she's a liberal plant, blah, blah, blah. This was a ruling against the liberals. It oh, really big time. was. Big time. The, and and this, is, this, is a, this is a question that the liberals are very, very scared of because this can make the prime minister look really, really bad depending on what, what the possible answer is. Now, the answer may be, oh, well, you know, it's nothing. But... It's very important because it impeaches the Prime Minister's testimony yesterday. And we've already had um, two things in, impeached in terms of the Prime Minister's testimony yesterday. So, M Madam Commissioner, the way that uh, I think has been uh, testified to by different people is CSIS um, would be preparing material uh, and uh, intelligence reports and assessment, and that is distributed to the Privy Council office. So the, um, the uh, I believe that the National Security Intelligence Advisor has testified to that, but I can say it is my understanding that the uh, the, the material is then uh, uh, processed by the Privy Council office, the National Security Intelligence Advisor's office, to be uh, produced to the Prime Minister. So uh, we have. Uh, as I testified, uh, I have used both methods, so specific material and uh, briefing material in writing and also those verbal briefings. What uh, I think is important is that uh, all of that is underpinned by, uh, by intelligence products 
that uh, are uh, are with the Privy Council office, and then are able uh, they're, they're able to disseminate that to uh, the Prime Minister's office and the Prime Minister, as required. So, th I think it's important to understand that this is, uh, if I can use expression, an ecosystem. It is not just one method, one person, but uh, you you have those verbal briefings, those written briefings, and intelligence products. And I think this is uh, how uh, we have to understand uh, how we are uh, conveying in information, engaging in discussions, answering questions uh, throughout uh, the, the, the year, if you want. So what I'm getting from that is he's saying, listen, just because I may have a briefing on such and such a date, that's not the only method in which we transmit information. And specifically that we transmit information to the prime minister. Right. So what he's saying is uh, we, we give briefings and intelligence artifacts to the, the Privy Council office, which is the prime minister's department. And in addition to his briefings that he actually goes in and, and talks with the prime minister, talks with the national security advisor, talks with the Minister of Public Safety. Remember, it's, it's not just the Prime Minister that, that he's briefing, it's multiple members of the Cabinet. So he's doing that, as well as the Privy Council Office having all of these artifacts. So he's basically saying, you can't say that CSIS isn't giving you things because we're giving it to you in multiple mediums in multiple ways. Well, and going back to the question, it doesn't sound like the Prime Minister has made the stipulation that all intelligence must be given to him by mouth orally right that yeah we do give him papers to read and we say hey just so you know here's an update yada 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 and that way and this makes a heck of a lot more sense this way the prime minister can then go to the privy council office and say okay uh Vigno just told me this what do we have on that but guess what he's probably not doing any of that any of that Thank you. Commissioner, I have one question about uh, document 4495, and, and then I'll be done. If you could pull that up, please, Mr. Clerk. And if you go, please, to page two, about one third down. Um, there we are. Yes. Uh, Director, it's the bullet point. We know that the PRC clandestinely and deceptively interfered in both the 2019 and 2021 general elections. Uh, is this uh, knowledge something that you uh, or the service as a body have communicated uh, to the Prime Minister uh, or the Prime Minister's office? Madam Commissioner, uh, it is indeed something that has been uh, communicated. I uh, believe that uh, I testified to that in uh, where I said uh, in our assessment um, we saw foreign interference in both the 2019 and 2021 elections. Uh, however, uh, I concur with the uh, results of the panel, the conclusion of the panel, that this uh, interference did not amount to uh, having um, had the impact on, on the general election. So uh, I, I think it's important to understand that both statements, uh, uh, in my opinion, are true at the same time. You, we saw foreign interference during those elections, and that inf interference was indeed clandestine and deceptive. And at the same time, uh, that interference did not amount to have uh, an impact on the uh, integrity of the election. And if I may just finally uh, follow up on this one point, if you're, if you're able to say, Director, and I appreciate you may not be, are you able to say whether the interference referred to in this bullet is limited to Don Valley North in 2019 and Steveston, uh, Richmond East in 2021, or whether it's broader? Um, I think, Madam Commissioner, the best way to to answer the question is um, is uh, refer back to the summary that the government has published in um, uh, public uh, as to the commission has pub made public regarding the uh, specific information on the eleven candidates and uh, thirteen staff members. Understood. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. 
So what that means is it's more than Don Valley North. It's more than Kenny Chu. That's what that means. Well, and from what the papers have said, it's up to 11, seven of whom were liberal and four who were conservative, I think, were the, was the breakdown. Right. And and the for those who don't know, the story around that was that the PRC was allegedly looking to funnel $250,000 to 11 candidates. Um but it wasn't uh, necessarily done. Yeah, it wasn't successful. So there, it, it, the two hundred fifty thousand didn't make it to to anybody. Is is what we are, uh, what we are led to understand by CSIS. Well, and that therefore no crime was committed because it didn't happen. It's just they were thinking about it. Yeah, and they and and plans were being set up, and uh, so um, you know interference was about to be committed, basically. So next one is uh, Council for Erin O'Toole. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, my name's Don Dryden, Director Vigneault. Uh, Clark, if you could bring up uh, CAN 4495 again, please. And if you could scroll down to the same place we were when Mr. Vander was examining. Thank you. Commissioner, just following on a question that Mr. Vander had asked, um, you answered him that you knew the, there was clandestine and deceptive interference in both elections, but it did not have an impact. Is the correct answer, as I understand the panel's conclusion, is that the impact did not meet the threshold specified in the cabinet directive? Um, Madam Commissioner, uh, um, uh, I'm using these words uh, with my own understanding. Uh, I think if you go back to my uh, exact testimony, I may have said that, you know, I concurred with the conclusion of the panel. Um, so in my, I just do not want to leave the impression because I may have used a language that is not identical in, in both times that I am um, edging uh, my answer is that I have, uh, I have absolutely concurred with the conclusion of the panel. Right. Thank you. And just to go back to the general issue of preparation of these documents, my understanding is that um, this briefing note sits at the top of probably a briefing binder of maybe 70 or 80 or more pages in order to support you in the course of that meeting. Is that correct? Um, Madam Commissioner, maybe uh, the best analogy I can give here is um, for uh, anyone who has uh, the chance or the opportunity to uh, attend a parliamentary committee hearing or watch uh, on TV, a parliamentary committee hearing, um, there is one coming through to all of these hearings is that you will see a senior official coming up with a big uh, black binder, a uh, very thick binder full of information. And I think the other thing that is uh, universally true of these meetings is that um, uh, no senior official is, is going through that binder uh, uh, from, from head to toe, uh, from top to bottom uh, in, uh, in the earring or even for the preparation. Uh, the way the material is being put together is to help the person who's going to testify, uh, give that person enough information, contextual information, but also very specific information. And so, um, uh, uh, Mr. Jarman, yes, I, 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 the way you describe it is this is, was one piece of, of many other pieces of briefing material that uh, formed the, uh, what I uh, would have used uh, for uh, such a uh, meeting. Thank you. And would the briefing note portion have been, I appreciate it wasn't given to the Prime Minister or the Prime Minister's office, but would the briefing note portion have been shared with the NSIA or someone at PCO in order that they would know what you were saying in that course, or what you could be anticipating to say in the course of that briefing. Uh, Madam Commissioner, in my experience, uh, I have seen both. Uh, sometimes that we would have uh, part or all of the briefing material share in advance with uh, the Privy Council Office, and other times where uh, no briefing material is shared uh, ahead of time. It depends uh, both on the issue uh, being discussed, the specific circumstances, the timelines involved, uh, the sensitivity of the information. So, they, uh, as I said, I, I have uh, and continue to uh, um, see both uh, cases where we, we share 
all or a portion of the material in cases where uh, nothing is shared ahead of time uh, or, or even uh, left behind after. But in this case, was this note shared with the NSIA or someone from PCO? Uh, Madam Commissioner, I, I do not remember that specific note, uh, unfortunately. Right, thank you. And if I could direct, uh, let's go down to the bottom in the conclusion paragraphs. So we've heard from the Prime Minister and others that there are certain generic or not, generic is not the right word, certain general uh, messages that are consistently referred to. And during meetings uh, dealing with specific topics that those wouldn't be conveyed because they're already understood. Are these the sorts of messages that are so consistently conveyed by you that everyone knows they're, they're accurate and they don't need to be restated? Madam Commissioner, um, uh, if I can use the example of the, the, the specific point where it says uh, foreign interference is therefore uh, low risk and high reward, uh, as I testified to you a few minutes ago, I have uh, said that repeatedly uh, and uh, to the point where some uh, colleagues are now uh, starting to use the same uh, vernacular. Okay, thank you. And then can we scroll up to the page Mr. Three? Jarman, it's going to be your last question because your time is already over. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, looking at that uh, page three, the comment with respect to Mr. Chu and Mr. O'Toole. Thank you. Um, these observations in that bullet that start, we also observed and ended up by directed by the PRC. Those are prepared by your staff and they represent those words are chosen with intention. Is that correct? Uh, yes, Madam Commissioner. These these words, you know, uh, are uh, I've been uh, carefully uh, selected, and as I testified to earlier, the they represent uh, our understanding of the situation. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Fignot. Thank you. Okay, so those are the two most important lawyers to be speaking with David Vigneault today, and. Um, you know, that last question by Aaron O'Toole's lawyer was very important because, again, you know, it was called into question whether or not, uh, you know, the PRC was interfering with Aaron O'Toole and Kenny Chu. So the question to David Vignot was, was the wording in there, you know, used with specific intention? Yes, it was, because that's our understanding of what happened. So pretty much that um, the Prime Minister knew that Kenny Chu and Aaron O'Toole were being affected by this PRC in a negative way. So negative for the conservatives, but positive for Trudeau and the liberals. And remember, Aaron O'Toole didn't know until late last year. And we know that because as soon as he knew, he raised a question of privilege. And what was the question of privilege? That the PRC was interfering. This, this is going to turn into a field day. Well, and this, or at least this is part of why Trudeau did not want this inquiry. Right, because he knew. He knew this stuff, and what he didn't want us to know is when he knew it. It sounds to me like he knew the PRC's interference was benefiting the Liberals during the election. Which is why he didn't really do anything. Right? So this is this is what's coming out. And it's gonna be very interesting to see what the next steps are from this because here's the thing. It comes it comes back to this again. Either Trudeau or David Vigneault are lying. This is where you know Michael Chong and his lawyer, they have to be furious. And Aaron O'Toole and his lawyer have to be furious. And Kenny Chu and his lawyer have to be furious. And Canadians as well. Because you have a guy that is making a mockery of the prime ministerial position, saying he doesn't read anything, and he's contradicting what all of his staff are saying. Any way you slice or dice this, this looks really, really bad for the prime minister.